So Jeff, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I want to begin just by sharing with you, that, like I found your book, Creation Rediscovered, so valuable and helpful for me in my own faith as I study the Bible and um, and struggle and wrestle with like the creation accounts and the way that you handle it in, in your book and the amount of empathy you display um, because there's so much controversy. There's so many arguments between Christians on the creation accounts in scripture and how do we interpret them? So I wanted to start off by, first of all, thanking you for writing Creation Rediscovered and then beginning by asking you, like, how can we as Christians display more empathy for each other when it comes to like the creation accounts in the Bible? So uh, it's a great question, Mike. Um, and thank you for that, uh, that those kind comments about the book. Um, you know, a lot of what uh, I put in the book or what I put in print was uh, basically sort of uh, a, a way of, of putting in print what I teach my students because a lot of those students are coming to college and they're running into a dilemma. And the dilemma they have is that they love the Bible, um, they, they love God, they're passionate about their faith, but at the same time, they're also starting to love science. And it's creating a kind of cognitive dissonance for them because it seems as if they've been told, well, you can't do both. Um, or you can only learn, uh, love certain kinds of science. So you can love the sort of practical science that makes your iPhone, but you're not allowed to, you know, you have to suddenly sort of, um, you know, draw a line and say, but when it comes to anything about, say, the age of the earth or biology or things like that, then you can't love it anymore. And this is a dilemma that I, I really just don't feel like the students ought to be put into, that there are a lot of casualties in the battle over creation that they're just needless casualties. And one of the things that I do to try to introduce this topic to my students is I basically just kind of talk to them a little bit about maybe understanding what, uh, you know, just how foreign the Bible is to us as Western readers. You know, we're, we're so close to it that it seems like it was written yesterday. And the truth is, this is the product of a place that was very different um, than the world that we inhabit. They thought about the world in a different way. They, they almost inhabited a different world because, you know, they, when they, for example, thought about what shooting stars were, well, they thought there were stars because how in the world, if you were an ancient person, how would you have distinguished between that little pinprick of light that's in the sky and that thing that streaks across the sky? Well, we know that's not the case today, but it, it's only because we're the inheritors of a, you know, a long train of science that's told us this. So part of what I try to do is to say, you know, when we go to the Bible, let's go as visitors. Let's, let's go as tourists and see how um, people in the Bible maybe looked at things differently, approached things differently than we would. And I, I always, I guess when I conclude that section of my lecture with them, I say, you know, if you were going to Thailand, probably what you would do is get a tour book and you would try to figure out, okay, what are some phrases I should learn? What are some customs that I should learn or, or, or maybe things that I should avoid? What are some new and different foods that I need to expect uh, to try when I go there? And when we go, we would go as visitors. And rather than try to tell the people in Thailand how they ought to be doing things, we would want to try to learn from them. So maybe we should approach creation the same way when we're you know, coming to these texts of a culture that's far more different than our culture than Thailand is. Uh, from Western culture. So I, I think that's a good starting place for it. I love that. And I love the way you describe um, the idea of coming to the Bible, trying to understand the writer in their time. And I think your book is a fantastic tour guide to give us, give us a better perspective of ancient thinking about these mm -hmm. texts. And one of the things I wanted to share was when I was coming to your book, you began by talking about some of the early ideas about the earth and the way that the ancient Near East people wrote about creation. And you start off by talking about some of these other creation texts, which I never, <laughs> ever thought about. Because if you were asking me like, oh, the creation texts in the Bible, I would think, oh, that must be Genesis. Yeah. But you point out that there's all these texts in our Bible that refer to the creation of the world. And not, it's not just in Genesis. And I love maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I love those texts um, because one of the things I'll have my students do is I, I, I talk to them and I say, you know, part of your problem is you're too familiar with the Bible. 
Um, and the illustration I use, of course, none of them believe that I, as a Bible teacher, have actually said this to them, but I, I do. <laughs> and, and the illustration I'll use is I say, you know, you ever had that moment when you pull into your driveway and you suddenly have this kind of, you know, uh, startling revelation that says, how did I get here? It, and it's because, you know, you were behind the wheel, you know, clearly you were the one driving, but you have no recollection of the physical process that you took to actually get to your house. Well, and part of the reason is because your mind has wandered off to some other place. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's that experience of when we all had to do reading at the end of a semester and our brains are just gone. And so we, we look up and suddenly we say, oh my gosh, it's been three or four pages since I actually remembered any of the words or paid attention to the words that were on the page in front of me. And you have to just, you know, turn back page after page to finally find something that you actually saw. I think we do this with the Bible sometimes, is that we're so familiar with it that the words just sort of go into our eyes but never quite reach our brains. And some of these passages that are like that are these creation texts where all of a sudden you have this the whole constellation of text where God is fighting against the sea, fighting against Leviathan, fighting against this dragon named uh, Rahab, not, not the one from Joshua, but uh, Rahab really is her name. And, you know, the, these references to sea monsters. And I'll finally have some students sort of sheepishly raise a hand and say, are there dragons? And it's, they've read these passages before, but they've never stopped and slowed down enough to read them and ask questions of them and, and savor them, to finally get to that question, what in the world are these people talking about? And it's clear that in these texts that are talking about God creating the world as the end process of fighting against the sea and the dragon, there's got to be some sort of backstory there. That they're, they're using this imagery, and it's imagery, it's a little bit like when you watch a movie, and so, you know, they, they make some pop culture illusion that if you don't know the background story, the illusion inside the movie sort of falls flat. There's this uh, great line in the Avengers where uh, uh, Iron Man says to Thor, you know, uh, no hard feelings, point break. But if you don't know the movie Point Break about all these <laughs> surfers with shoulder length blonde hair, then you, you kind of go, what? Why, why do you just call that guy point break? Uh, you know, what's up with that? Right. Right. These are those sorts of texts. They're making illusions. And if you don't know the backstory, then you don't pick up on the illusions. I love that. Um, so can you talk about the illusions of the battle between God and the Leviathans? So what's so interesting is uh, there's this Babylonian creation story that's called uh, the Enuma Elish. And uh, it, it's a it's an interesting story. What it really is about is they're trying to wrestle with you know, how did the city of Babylon get to be the chief city? And, you know, how does Marduk, uh, the Babylonian chief god, get to be at the top of the pantheon? Because he's, he's not the oldest god. And so this story walks through, uh, you know, how creation begins with nothing but water. And, uh, you know, through a series of battles, eventually Marduk fights this dragon named Tiamat, uh, kills her, splits her in half, creates the world from her carcass, um, and then eventually creates humanity to do the work of the gods, you know, there in the story. And when you really dig down into the details, it is so clear that these biblical stories in Psalm 74, Psalm 89, Isaiah 51, Job 7, Job 26, and so forth, they're all alluding to this kind of story. And so God is fighting against the sea, which is also a dragon, just like Tiamat is also the sea in the Babylonian story. Uh, God is splitting the sea. He's creating the world from the remains of this, you know, sort of chaotic mess that was there. And as a result, God becomes king. And it's the same story as what uh, Marduk is doing in the Enumai Leash. It's the kind of illusion that somebody in the biblical world would have readily picked up on. That, you know, when they hear God's fighting against the sea and becoming king and creating the world, well, this was just the story that was, you know, circulating around at that time. And what the Bible's doing is, you know, honestly, I think they're doing a couple of things with it. One thing the biblical authors are doing is speaking in the language of their neighbors. And so they're just, you know, putting this into terms that I think maybe, on the one hand, maybe the Babylonians would understand. But truthfully, putting it in the language that Israelites influenced by Babylon would understand. 
because the Israelites, had, you know, they've been in captivity in Babylon. They've heard these kinds of stories. These stories had made their way to Israel long before even the, the Babylonian exile. So part of what they're doing is even talking to their own people in theological terms that they would understand. And I don't think it's that crazy of an idea. This is what we do with our own kids, for example, when we uh, try to teach them about theological ideas. I, uh, I had a, a moment when uh, I, it was not my finest parenting moment, but I, I let my sons watch Jurassic Park when they were far too young. <laughs> five and seven seemed like it was old enough. I mean, you know, Barney's the dinosaur. Or there's dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Really sure. about the same thing. And it was a it was a disaster. Um, my my older son was okay, but my younger son Elijah, um, <laughs> my wife put him to bed. She comes out of the room and looks at me with this look that just says, "Thanks, you've broken the child." <laughs> So, oh. so I, I go in, and there he is. He's got the little chin quiver going on, you know. And I, and I, I knew what was wrong, but I said, Elijah, you, you okay? And he says, I'm kind of scared of the T-Rex. And I remember vividly saying to him, you know, Elijah, there are no more T-Rexes. Well, you can imagine how well that went over for a kid who's just watched two hours of T-Rexes on the TV. Of course there are T-Rexes. And I, I said, after that, I said, if there were any T-Rexes, Abba, my, my sons call me Abba, I said, Abba would kill them. And mm -hmm. he, was, he was a little bit better with that one. And the last one I said is, well, and uh, um, besides, God is with us wherever we go. And you could tell at this moment that he was trying to buck up his courage a little bit. And he went, yeah. And God is so big that like his little toe could kick a T-Rex and it would just kill him. And at that moment, I, of course, said to him, well, you know, technically, son, God is incorporeal. And so he doesn't actually have little toes. And, you know, it's, it's you know, sort of Orthodox Christian thought that it's wrong to attribute a body to God and so forth. And, and, and at this point, when I'm telling this to my students, they're like, you did what? And I said, no, <laughs> I didn't tell them that. What I said was, you're right. But the truth is, he wasn't right. God is incorporeal, and he doesn't have little toes to kick T-Rexes and so forth. Well, why did I affirm something that theologically is not exactly true? It's because I was putting it into language he could understand. And I think that that's what some of these biblical authors are doing, is they're borrowing these images of creation that are around them to put into terms that their readers and hearers could understand. This is, you know... If there were a God who took on the sea and, and tamed the forces of chaos, it would be our God and, and not Marduk, certainly. Uh, that's such a sweet story, um, how you're comforting your son. And I, have, I have two little ones, so I think about, I think about that. And like, so I'm wondering for, like, for parents listening in, because uh, sometimes I struggle when I'm talking to my kids about Bible texts like this, where... I'm wrestling with it. I'm not even sure what I think about it. I'm running to commentaries. I'm going to your book. Like, how do I now kind of explain this to my kids? Um, so if we're talking specifically maybe about the Leviathan and God wrestling with the Leviathan, how would you uh, talk to this to a child who's like, hey, dad, what does this mean? Yeah. You know, it's it's not an easy question. Um, and... Uh, I, I kind of laugh because uh, down on my workbench in my basement is a drawing of creation as it appears in Genesis 1. And so I, I've got it in a particular style. And I, I, I laugh because I, I imagine I'm the only person in planet Earth or on planet Earth who has a drawing of, you know, the dome overhead <laughs> with the ocean and so forth on their workbench, you know, down there. Well, I have that drawing because one of my sons came and asked me and said, how are we supposed to read? these kinds of texts. I, I don't know that I'm right in my approach to this, but I tend to take a kind of VeggieTales sort of approach because I think what VeggieTales is trying to do is to put biblical ideas into language that kids can understand at an age-appropriate level. I don't know if they always get it exactly right, but what, what, what is one supposed to do with the story of David and Bathsheba when you're talking to a six-year-old, I mean, how do you talk about David committing adultery and eventually murder? I don't know how to convey that story to a six-year-old kid. I, I can tell the story of David and Goliath, 
but it's harder to tell that story. And so what VeggieTales does is it's King George and, you know, who's uh, envious of the rubber ducky uh, that somebody had. <laughs> I, I, my favorite of these is, you know, in the story of Esther, when uh, instead of having the enemies who were going to kill, you know, uh, Mordecai and Esther, well, what happens instead of their being killed is they're sent to the island of perpetual tickling. <laughs> well, I, I don't, I mean, obviously that doesn't capture what happened in the story, but how do I talk to a five or six year old about Haman and his crew being hung on the gallows that were, you know, prepared for Mordecai? I think what we're doing is we're kind of speaking in the language that kids will understand. And I don't see any problem with our talking about some of the stories. Um, you know, I would say this even in, uh, with, with regard to parables, treating stories that are parables as if they were just history stories, because at that age, they really can't distinguish between the two. And so it doesn't bother me to talk about the story of the Good Samaritan as if it's a story of something that happened when I realized that it's just a parable and didn't really happen, because there's no need in trying to get a six-year-old to try to distinguish between what's history and what's parable type fashion. So when my kids were little, when we talked about the story of creation and we talked about Noah's Ark or those sorts of things, I just talked to them in, you know, just straightforward fashion as if these were just, you know, Bible stories. And once they got older, they eventually reached ages where they could think through issues of genre better. And we could talk about, you know, how foreign people uh, or people inhabiting this foreign world of the Bible had different generic categories than we have. And we could start to sort through those issues. Jeff, I, I also love the fact that you have a drawing of how the ancient people saw our world. Can you describe this drawing of like how ancient people, especially those who are writing our Bible and the creation accounts, how they viewed our world? You know, it's so fascinating to me because um, if you read Genesis 1 literally, um, which I, I certainly try to do, well, what you end up with is God on the second day separates the waters from the waters and he uses something solid to do that. And the, you know, the Hebrew word for it is the rakia. Uh, I like the King James translation. They describe it as a firmament, which is, you know, something that's firm, something that's solid. So what, basically what they're thinking of is that there's this dome that goes overhead, and that's what uh, supports this upper ocean that was above us. And, uh, you know, what ancient people, I mean, all ancient peoples understood that this was the way that the world was structured. What they argued about was what was the dome made of. And so, for example, uh, if you read in some of the intertestamental literature, you'll see where uh, some people say that it was made out of uh, uh, crystal, and some people will say that it's made out of metal, and some people say that it's made out of porcelain. And you go, well, why would they think this? Well, it, it's crystal, because you can see the waters, or maybe it's metal, because the word rakia comes from this word that has to do with hammering out metal. Or how about porcelain? Well, it's because that's what you make bowls out of. Uh, you make them out of clay. Uh, Josephus talks about how the reason that they built the Tower of Babel was so they could make their way all the way up to the rakia and then dig into it and figure out what it was made of. Um, and so this is the way everybody thinks about the way the world is structured. And they also, and, and this is it's also there in Genesis 1, they understood that the sun, moon, and stars were on this side of the waters. So they're embedded up in the dome. And you look at it and you go, well, that's the craziest structure of the universe I've ever heard of. And I, I argue that, no, it's not. This is what the world looks like. When we're kindergartners and we draw a landscape, mm -hmm. we draw a yellow sun with a blue background. Now, it, it may be that we draw the limit of our atmosphere at 50 miles, and the sun is 93 million miles away, but to the naked eye, what it looks like is there's a sun with a blue background. And it's obvious why that blue background has to be water. Well, it's because it's blue. It's blue for the same reason that the ocean is blue, because this is, a, this is something that's full of water. This is where the rain comes from. I mean, we understand that the clouds get their waters from evaporation. They didn't understand that. They assume that it's these windows of heaven that continue to restock them. And so this is their structure of the ancient world. And, and that's the picture uh, that I have on my workbench is this picture of the rakia uh, that's there with the sun, moon, and stars. 
it, it describes the world the way a person without Galileo's telescope would understand what the world looked like. Um, and it, it stays uh, as the, the understanding of the world really all the way up until just about Copernicus because people continue to have these ideas of these spheres that are there. The planets are in different spheres. The stars are in a separate set of spheres. The, the uh, heaven of heavens is in a different one. This is just the way people looked at the world. And I, I thought it interesting, too, that um, within this dome, and, it, and certainly in Genesis 1, we see that there are these two lights, the two lights, one guarding the day, one at, one at the night. And you point out that, well, obviously the moon isn't a light in the same way the sun is a light. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, it's uh, one of these additional elements of how they're describing the world in terms of how it would look to them. So it, it is a form of science. You know, you, you're observing the world, you're seeing what it looks like to you and explaining it. Um, it, it just may not be the way that we understand the world to look today. Um, but they uh, imagined that the moon produced its own light. Um, and so when you look, for example, in the Gospels, and it talks about, you know, in those days, uh, you know, the sun will uh, not give its light, the moon will not give its light. And it says, and the stars will fall from the heavens. Well, there, this is just a, a, a cavalcade <laughs> of different things that aren't exactly, you know, the way that we understand science today. The moon doesn't actually give its own light. It's just a big mirror uh, because of, you know, its uh, selenium content that's in its surface. It's very reflective. And so it can be so bright that sometimes you go out at night and you can see your shadow from the moonlight, except it's not really the moon's light. It's just a reflected light from the sun. And truthfully, you know, even the idea that the moon gives its light is not quite as problematic as the notion that the sun, uh, I'm sorry, that the stars will fall from the heavens. Mm. If we uh, understand these as shooting stars, you know, oh, sure, here comes a, you know, little grain of dust that our atmosphere is, you know, burning up as it passes through. Well, that, that's fine. It's just not what they meant when they spoke about this in the Bible. They understood this to be the stars. Well, we now know that the stars are massive and ferocious. Uh, you know, there's the biggest star they've ever you know, discovered, this uh, star called UY Scuti. If you put it where the sun is, its perimeter is where the orbit of Jupiter is. If that, wow. if that falls and hits us, it's going to hurt. Um, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's this, it's this notion that they're describing the world the way that it looks. We just know that it doesn't look quite the same or to us today because we've benefited from, you know, a lot of scientific instrumentation that's been, you know, brought along. But, you know, truth be told, even today, if I look up at the sky and see these stars, I still look up at the, at the stars and kind of misperceive the way that they look. They, they look for all the world to me like they exist in a bowl. It's almost like it's a flat plane. Like I could look at Orion and I get into my head this notion that I could get on a really speedy rocket ship and fly out and I could look at the stars of Orion along their sides and see how they're all lined up. The truth is, uh, two of the stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel, they are 600 light years apart. Not side oh. to side, but in depth from us. Wow. wow. They just look to us as if they're in a flat plane. If I were describing the world today based on my own naked eye observation, I would come up with a kind of description that sounds very similar to what they had in the Bible. Yeah, I think what um, your book is really helpful too is to also understand like the church's perspective during the times of Copernicus. Because as you were just talking, like the early church, as they were kind of looking at their world, the way that they perceive things, this is what they saw. And this is also the way that they read Genesis was that the world was constructed in a certain way, that the sun and moon were lights, um, stars were within this dome. Um, and so when Copernicus came in and said, actually, the earth isn't the center of the universe, like that didn't make sense to them the way that they read the Bible or how they perceive things because they see the sun going around the earth. Yeah. Um, so I love the way that you, you talk about that in your book. Um, but I want to ask you about like kind of the early churches, the way that they dealt with the scientists and 
the kind of the theology that kind of erupted because you write a lot about Martin Luther, Melanchthon, Calvin in their own preaching, how they they preached against the science the science of the earth not being the center of the universe. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting kind of dilemma because on the one hand, you know, what we call the scientific revolution is really just the heir to centuries of scholastic thought from Aquinas and so forth. And so that same, uh, in other words, if you think about scholasticism, it's this belief in the rationality of God and of God's creation and of the human beings that God made and the, and the human mind. And so we can apply that rationality to theological issues. And all, all you know, uh, believers did was just continue to expand that notion of the rationality of God and God's creation and began to discover things about the physical world. And it, it's why all of these, you know, monumental figures in early science, well, they're all Christians, you know, whether it's Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Leibniz, you know, those kinds of, um, you know, scholars, they're just applying the same Christian techniques to the physical world. So on the one hand, there's a, a kind of Christian foundation for the scientific revolution. I think where uh, theologians got into trouble or where, um, you know, uh, people in, in uh, positions of power in the church got in trouble, it's almost this notion of kind of a, a misunderstanding of the sola scriptura idea. That, you know, the, the real heart of sola scriptura is that the scriptures give us everything that's necessary for belief and practice. But you can also take sola scriptura to mean that, you know, all knowledge is contained inside of the scriptures. And I think that's what tripped up, you know, Luther and Melanchthon and, and Calvin and so forth, was the notion that everything that we need to know, not just about salvation or theology or how we're supposed to act, but also things like the physical world were included inside of scripture. And so there was a kind of natural um, hesitation to accept these ideas that seemed like they went counter to the way that maybe the Bible would describe the you know the sun coming up and the sun setting and so forth, and I think I think truthfully the church probably lost a lot of credibility with the scientific community, with, you know if that's what we want to call it at that time, because it kind of dug in its heels about some of these issues, and as a result lost that standing to be able to um, to speak authoritatively on areas where it could because it had uh, kind of stuck its neck out too far in areas where, you know, Calvin, for all that he's wonderful about, or, or Luther, d really didn't have any scientific uh, credibility at all. And so they squandered some credibility by uh, trying to, you know, kind of, I guess, the what I said before, dig in their heels on some issues where they shouldn't have. What are some lessons that we as Christians could take away from this as we look at the way that Maybe some of these theologians or Christian thinkers rejected science because uh, they were really trying to honor Scripture and their perception of the universe. They really were trying to be fa faithful readers of the Bible and reject anything that seemed to combat Scripture um, and their view of Scripture. Um, so I'm trying to look at them like they're trying to be faithful, but yeah. obviously they made a lot of mistakes. And some of the sermons that you cite from Calvin and Luther, I was shocked at some of the things they said about people who believed that the earth wasn't the center of the universe. Um, but what are some lessons you would say that we can take away from those, those periods? You know, it's a great question because um, I think if there's, uh, if there's one thing that I learned the most from their approach to this, it's to remember that the Bible is also the product of human authors. And, uh, you know, there's a, a long kind of section that I, I do in the book, and I certainly do this in my classes with my students, where I use the analogy of Jesus, who, as a human being, is able to do things that God simply can't do. Uh, you know, God, God can't get thirsty, he can't get tired, he can't get hungry, he can't learn, and yet Jesus does all of these things. And this is just one of those Christian mysteries that's related to the fact that Christians view Jesus as both human and divine. Well, the other entity that, that uh, does this same thing and is both human and divine is the scriptures. That this is, on the one hand, God's word. On the other hand, God used human beings to write this word. 
And in the same way that Jesus' humanity is fully expressed in the gospel so that he he weeps in the garden and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? That he, he's every bit a human being. Well, the people who wrote the Bible were every bit human beings. And so God didn't overwhelm their humanity and suddenly give the author of Genesis 1 an understanding of quantum mechanics. He let that author right using the culture and the language and the understanding of that day and age. And once you allow for that human side of the Bible to be there, suddenly nearly all of these mm -hmm. scientific questions just sort of slip to the wayside. That you, you understand, well, of course that's the way they understood their world back in that time. This was not a book that was written to tell us about these various scientific issues. In fact, there's no evidence that anyone in the ancient world had the least bit of concern about the scientific nature of creation. What they were trying to describe is what's the nature of the creation now, and what is the character of the creator who produced it. Well, that's what the biblical stories are all about, is they're trying to tell us something about why is the world the way that it is, and what can we learn from the world about the person who made it. Well. I take as authoritative uh, those things that it says about the world and that it says about the God who made them. I just don't think that these were texts that ever meant to try to describe in a scientific way the nature of creation or the created uh, or the process of creation. And I, I just, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I just know that for myself, there was an incredible amount of freedom that came from coming to that conclusion because I no longer had to sort of hold scientific discoveries at arm's length and wait for a moment to decide, okay, can I fit this into my worldview or not? Science is wonderful at the things that science is competent to do. And I, I love those things. I mean, I, I have an iPhone. Uh, when I go to the doctor and have surgery and have an arthroscopy, I, praise be to science uh, for you know the things that it has done. It's, it's just that's not exactly what the Bible's talking about. Um, and, the, and the truth is, you know, because we uh, as, as Christians to some degree squandered mm -hmm. some of our authority uh, in the scientific realm, we also gave license to scientists to abuse their authority in that realm. Um, science, I mean, I, I love science. I'm a, I'm a devotee of science. I, I, I absolutely, you know, adore it. But um, science is a tool, and science has arrogated it to itself to the position of arbiter of all truth. And that's simply not a role that science is meant to fill. Um, there are questions that science is absolutely incapable of addressing. When you, uh, from a scientific perspective, use words like beauty or truth or right or wrong or ought, these are nonsense terms from a scientific perspective. Um, these are things that science simply can't address. And so I, I'm more comfortable when, as a student of Scripture, I'm looking at those things that Scripture is meant to address, and then as a student of science, looking at those things that science is meant to address. I love how you talk about kind of your movement and kind of the, the freedom that you had once you um, took Genesis and those creation accounts as not science, but looking at it in a different way, the freedom that that brought you. Can you talk about some of the beauty, maybe now that you can see, maybe in the Genesis 1 story of creation, when we're not looking at Genesis 1 as, as a scientific text, um, but as as a text that someone wrote and how they want to explain the creation of the world and maybe some of the beauty, poetry, allegory that now that when you read Genesis 1 personally, the things that you see. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the echoes of the Enuma Elish that are present in Psalm 74, 89, or Isaiah 51, those kinds of texts, I argue that those are also present in Genesis 1 that um, the, the basic form of the Babylonian creation text is a text that's echoed in Genesis 1 as well. Like the Babylonian text, it starts off with these primordial waters. The, the word that's used in Genesis 1 verse 2 for the deep 
is the word tahom. Well, tahom is just a Hebrew cognate of that word tiamat, which is the uh, that dragon that represents the sea in Babylonian thought. Uh, Marduk suppresses Tiamat with his winds. It's the wind of God that suppresses the waters in Genesis 1-2. You know, Marduk creates by splitting Tiamat's carcass. That's what God does in Genesis uh, 1 on days 1, 2, and 3. He separates light from dark. He separates the waters from the water, separates the water from the land. So I think all of those echoes are there. The thing that's different, though, about Genesis 1 as opposed to, say, Psalm 74. Psalm 74 is almost just a duplicate of Enumai Leash. Genesis 1 is more like an echo. It's a kind of allusion over to it that says, Babylon, I'm talking to you. I want you to know that I'm aware of how you do creation. Now let me show you how a real God does creation. And it's in the differences in the portrayal of God between Genesis 1 and the Enumai Leash that I think the real beauty of the text emerges. In Genesis 1, there is one God and only one God. In Babylon, you can't swing a cat without hitting a God. I mean, it's they're all over the place, and Marduk's having to scratch and claw to get himself to the top of the pantheon. Not in Genesis 1, just in the beginning, God. Not only is there just one God, but it's the manner in which God creates. In Genesis 1, it's so effortless. He just says, be, and creation flies to obey his will. In the, the story in Babylon, you've you got Marduk getting a, a bow and arrow and the wind and the net, and he's having to capture Tiamat and shoot her in the heart and cut her open like a, she's a dried fish that you're splitting in half. This is not the God of Genesis 1. This is a God who just effortlessly says, be, and everything happens the way he wants it to. And there's some, a strong polemical element in Genesis 1 uh, that emerges, especially when you think about, for example, the lights of creation. So if you think about day one when God says, let there be light, and there was light, you know, he called the light day and the darkness he called night. None of this makes sense from a scientific perspective. That, you know, suddenly we just have these random photons that are there, and, and, and you, you put the dark tons over on one side of the universe and the light tons over on this side. None of this makes sense. And, and what does it mean for there to be light? Uh, I'm sorry, for there to be day and night, evening and morning, when you don't have the sun and, and the moon and so forth? Well, the reason the text is doing this, it creates light and doesn't get around to the sun, moon, and stars until day four because the sun, moon, and stars were Babylonian deities. This is the way Genesis 1 says, yeah, I'll get to you guys when I get to you. You're just not that big a deal. I can create light, and I don't need you to do it. When he does finally create them on day four, he doesn't even dignify the sun and the moon, who were important deities in Babylon. The, the sun is Shamash, the god of justice. Uh, Sin is the moon god. Um, he's the god of fishing and, and dairy farming. Um, he, he doesn't even call them by name. He just says, yeah, the big light and the little light. And the, the best part of the whole thing is when you get to the end of verse 16, it just says, and the stars. Every star that one of these ancient people could have seen up in the sky, a sky free of pollution, a sky with no light pollution, they saw this ocean of stars over their heads, this Milky Way of stars, and they looked at it, and God, in one word in Hebrew, kokavim, says, eh, stars, whatever. This is a portrayal of a kind of deity that is on a different level than what the Babylonians were worshiping. If you, if you sort of put it into modern terms, it would be as if you um, are, are someone saying to the Babylonians, you guys are worshiping Batman. Let me show you what a real God is like. You, you don't even have a, I mean, you guys don't have to have like a Superman. You, you've got Aquaman <laughs> is about as much as you've got. This is what a real God looks like. And it's no surprise that that vision of God became so compelling so that half the world today worships this monotheistic God that's presented in Genesis 1, whether you're talking about Christianity or Judaism or Islam, whereas nobody until Reddit came about on the internet worshiped <laughs> Marduk. Um, it had all disappeared. Um, where in the timeline of Genesis 1 would the the Leviathan battle 
happen or the battle with the sea that's mentioned in other texts? Where would that kind of fit in? Well, you know, what's interesting is I, I'm convinced that Genesis 1 removes that battle entirely. And so you do have in verse 2, the Tiamat is there, the Tahom, which is that deep in verse 2. But what is distinct is that uh, the, the deep does not resist God in any way. It is just sitting there. And, and even though it's only sitting there, the, the wind of God is hovering on top of it. There's this sense of it pressing down on it and uh, keeping it in control. So there's, there's no resistance. And I think one of the ways that you can pick out that it's trying to subvert this notion that there was a real battle is God does actually make the sea monsters in Genesis 1. But he doesn't do it until, I think it's verse 21. It's well into the text on day 5. They're just... They're like fish that are there in the sea. And uh, Psalm 104 is this beautiful psalm that kind of uh, recapitulates in poetic form the six days of creation. And it, it has the sea monsters in exactly the same place, well off into the latter part of the creation week. And it says there, you made Leviathan to sport with. So this poet picks up on the fact that the sea monsters, they represent Leviathan, but what is the purpose of Leviathan? It's not this dread character that terrifies the gods and, and uh, sets everyone in fear. All it is is your plaything, you know, that it's there just as a toy. It's your pet that you have. And so you can tell that they're undercutting this notion that God actually had to fight in order to achieve mastery over creation. Wow, that's beautiful. And uh, I love the way you described, like, the picture that, the writer of Genesis was presenting to us as this Yahweh, this God is much, much different from all the other gods, all the other creation accounts you have seen out there. And this God is just speaking things into existence. Like you said, they yeah. become things based on his yeah. word. And then the way you describe like, the creation of the stars is like an afterthought, like, yeah. oh, and the stars. It's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, it's one of the most compelling parts of the whole chapter to my mind, because I'm kind of a an amateur astrology, uh, not astrology, that would be wrong, astronomy buff. Um, but today in class, what we were talking about is Babylonian uh, magic and witchcraft. And so we've been talking a lot about astrology and these kinds of things. So that's just what I have on my mind. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know, I, I've got my telescope and I, I love when there's some particular kind of uh, celestial thing that's going on to take a look at it. And, you know, it, it's one of these places where Genesis 1 is a text that gives and gives and keeps on giving. You know, the prophets, their words, they were true then, and they're true later, and they're true later, and they're true later. Genesis 1 does this. The biblical authors saw far more stars than I get to see when I go out at night. I, I see a hundred. They saw thousands because they didn't have the same pollution that we have to wrestle with. On the other hand, because of the, the beauty of science, we actually know there are far more stars than they ever imagined. And yet we can reaffirm that same idea that to the God that's described in Genesis 1, even the vast trillions and quadrillions of stars that are out there, this is a God who just says be. And then he brings them into being. So it's, and you know, I, I'm a science buff, and so I think the process by which God brought them to, into being was this long, slow symphony uh, that has taken place, you know, over the last, uh, you know, many, many years. Uh, but uh, I don't see that as any sort of threat to uh, the way that Genesis 1 describes this creator. Well, it's absolutely beautiful the way you presented Genesis 1, uh, both here and also the way you expand on it in your book. Um, before we go, Jeff, can you give advice for uh, the reader out there who is maybe struggling? Um, they've 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 read all the debates between Christians on Genesis one, and they're maybe feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, and maybe just like ready to give up. And like when they get to Genesis, just let's move on and quickly get past this creation account. As soon as I let the debate between science and the Bible end, I fell in love with Genesis one. I had, when I grew up as a kid, um, I, I looked at, I was, a, I was a really strong, committed scientific creationist, 
And as a result, I never really read Genesis 1 for what Genesis 1 was trying to say. And so all I was trying to do was use this as an apologetic text to somehow undercut evolution or, or something like that. And so my concerns were foregrounded, and I just completely missed this beautiful text. As soon as I let this um, conflict between the Bible and science dissipate, I rediscovered this text and fell in love with it all over again, and truthfully found far more in it that's meaningful to me even when I'm discussing things with scientists. You know, one of the struggles that I think science has is they don't have a prime mover. They don't have a good explanation for getting things started. I think science struggles with the notion of coming up with an ought to tell people that you should do this. And I think um, one of the things that science can lead us into is uh, an idea of the perfectibility of human beings. And, and so there's this utopian vision. And the trouble is that utopian visions always end up being totalitarian whether it's 1984 or Brave New World or Pan Am. Well, when I read Genesis 1, I find the alternative to all three of these kinds of problems. I have my prime mover, and my prime mover is a loving God who cares about creation. And I'm able to come up with an ought because that loving God tells us that we're to pick up the baton and complete the act, or not complete, but continue the act of creation that we're to love one another, that we're to care for one another, that we're to treat creation like a garden, you know, the way the biblical image of it is. And I think we also end up uh, dispelling ourselves of this utopian vision as a vision that we think we can implement. Our job is to heal what we can. Our job is to find people who are hurting and give them comfort to live a moral life and banish chaos from ourselves to the degree that we can. But we also live in this dilemma of knowing creation will not be finished until the Creator finishes it. And so it, it puts some boundaries on our utopian vision and can kind of pull us back from being overly totalitarian in our trying to perfect humanity. And it, it gives us that light that's at the end, uh, frankly, of the other end of the Bible. It's when you get all the way to the very last two chapters of the Bible that you have this wonderful vision that says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there was no more sea. And you go a little bit later in the passage, and it says, and there was no night there. The author of Revelation is the best reader of creation in the entire Bible, because this is someone who figured out that part of what Genesis 1 is doing is this describing how the world begins with water and darkness, God begins the process of creation, but he doesn't finish it. And we live in this limbo of that unfinished creation, anticipating the day when God will make all things right, that there'll be that new heavens and new earth with no more sea and no more night there. I don't know if there's really a creation with no ocean and no darkness. That's not the point of the text. It's a time of saying that all of that brokenness of creation will one day not be broken anymore that uh, the, the tears will be wiped away, death will be no more, crying and pain will be no more, because Jesus makes all things new. I think that's a, a very biblical understanding of how creation works in the Bible. Oh, that is so beautiful. And I love how you brought Genesis and Revelation together to show the beauty of creation and the new creation to come. So, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for, for your time on the podcast and for writing this awesome book. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real treat to be with you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video clip from the Delgado podcast. To get more videos just like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. Take care.